What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to HQ. This is Big Dogs Gotta Eat, BDGE. I know the G and E are, are getting blocked, but I promise it says GE behind that. I'm joined my man Noah at FB God on Twitter. Make sure you are following him. We still need to get him to 1,000. Make sure I plug that in uh, on Twitter next week. You got to remind me. What are you at now? Right. What's the count up to? We want to do an actual live check this time around? I'm doing an actual live check and I'll fuck it up, yeah. Because your dog Let's is, see. you threw your dog into the basement, I suppose. That's so bright. Too bright. Everyone just got so angry. All right, it's backwards anyways. Let's say 867. Hey, that's like a 50, 50 person increase from last week, no? Yeah, I know. People have been watching and listening. Let's get this bread. Dude, these <laughs> videos get the most like thumbs up to thumbs down ratio. I'm pretty sure we're at they like- feel a, bad for me. They just want to see a kid live out his dream. Dude, it's, last video was like 250 to zero. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I, think I think they're going to run me off my channel. And eventually it's going to be the Noah show. Yeah, it's be public versus Nick. Just a little overhaul. <laughs> I'm going to join the public, and then we're going to <laughs> come to your house with pitchforks. Anyways, guys, we're getting into uh, some more bold predictions. Last week, we did the AFC edition. This week is going to be the NFC edition. And just like last time, Noah's going to hit me with five, six, seven bold predictions. And I'm going to tell him why he is either right or he is wrong. And uh, it's actually July 4th today. So happy July 4th, y'all. I know you guys are probably watching this on july 9th so it's like five days later if any weird news breaks or anything and we are behind the times on those that is the reason why no what are you doing this weekend you got any plans for july 4th i don't even know yet man we'll just we'll see what happens today we'll see no, how no, tape. no no yet it's kind of late like yeah, it is kind of late <laughs> july 4th <laughs> bro i got like check this out i brought my uh my bluetooth speaker to a friend's house like last weekend or two weeks two weekends ago and i left it there and i it's the boomstick and i use it all throughout the day, like nonstop, um, listening to podcasts or music or whatever. I haven't had it for two weeks. So I asked my, my roommate, like, hey, yo, you got any speakers at the house? And he's like, yeah, that like disco ball. And I, that shit looks like it's from 1970. So I was like, ah, joking. I was like, yeah, I'm sure it has Bluetooth. He's like, dude, it does. And it fucking rocks. You ready? Hold on. A little technology review. Let's see what's going on. Dude, it's got fucking lights in the background. It lights up the entire HQ. Same fucking rock. copyright strike right now. All right, hit the intro. All right. All right. No, no, shut your, shut your mouth. <laughs> Uh, okay, so we're going to hop into the, the the NFC bold predictions. And uh, Noah, hit us with your first bold, bold, bold take. All right. So first off the bat, we have the Detroit Lions in the NFC North. And we have that TJ Hawkinson finishes as a top eight tight end. And I honestly didn't have any bold predictions for this team just heading into it. And then I saw one of the comments on last video by Can't Guard Oscar, which is Mike Thomas's cousin, like uh, Can't Guard Mike. So <laughs> You look at – You think he's oh, getting that Saints tryout? He might do. They, they need somebody on the outside with Traquan Smith not really showing much. But Next. you look at the facts that he brought up, and I was pretty, like, amazed, like, the in-depth analysis he went through just to leave a comment on YouTube. But um, Daryl Bevel, like, his – the target share and the receiving share and everything that he used with Jimmy Graham was very high during his time in Seattle. Um, about 19% of the targets went to the tight end, 20% of the yards, 28% uh, of the touchdowns. And – these are all well and good, but you look at who Jimmy Graham is. He's a six seven tight end who is probably like the second best tight end we've seen over the past like 15 years. Um, so I, I didn't want to just lean on this argument alone. And also like the Stafford without Tate uh, targets the tight end 24% of the time. And it's not like Hawkinson's going to get every tight end target next year. So I wanted to look at what else um, Bevel did with his tight end. And the last tight end that he had of note was uh, Vince, Vicente Shanko. I can't pronounce that for the life of me. Um, Vasante Shanko, yeah. Vasante Shanko, yeah. I was, I was Wait, a lot. Guy, I don't mean to interrupt you, but what – did you say the bold prediction up front? Yeah, a top eight tight end. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'll continue. My bad. So, I'm Vasante bad. Shanko, um, back in Minnesota with Daryl Bevel. And I'll throw up, like, the athleticism and the measurables uh, between the two guys, Hawkinson and Shanko. They're, like, the same size, uh, both very good athletes. The only thing that really stands out is, like, the draft capital between the two. Shanko was a third-round pick where Hawkinson was a top ten pick last year. But um, his reception share, he averaged 14.2% of the team's receptions over his four years with Minnesota, uh, about 15% of their yards, and about 22% of their touchdowns. 
And if you just use those percentages and like extrapolate them and use the volume that they had this year in Detroit, that works out to a 53 reception, 561 yard and five touchdown uh, receiving line, which if you look at the tie, uh, tight end number eight this year, it was. You're good. TJ, it, yeah. TJ was, Hawk called. He said that your prediction isn't bold enough. He needs top five. He might break into it. But the number <laughs> eight tight end this year was um, David Njoku. He had 56 receptions, 639 yards, and four touchdowns. And obviously a lot of like value for tight ends comes on the back of these touchdowns. And five touchdowns for Hawkinson, I would say, is probably like where he'll land just because they have two other like red zone weapons in Kenny Galladay and Marvin Jones. Yeah, I'd put his, I'd put his over-under for touchdowns at like five and a half. Yeah, but he's like a very good receiver who's going to be used down by the red zone because he can block and he's got that size and he outproduced Noah Fant in college. I just think all in all, I think like top 12 is kind of his floor, but he's being drafted as a tight end 18 right now behind guys like Delaney Walker, who is coming off like a broken leg and he's going to be, I think, 35 or 36 this year. I just think his upside is that of a tight of a top eight tight end just because of who he is, the athleticism he has, and just how much production he's had at a young age paired with this uh, offensive coordinator who has shown he wants to use a tight end. Yeah, I saw that comment, and I, I commented back after because in my draft guide when I did the – you and me were doing the tight end write-ups, and I was doing Hawkinson, and I literally made this uh, chart, and I'll send it over to you to put on the screen. And I was looking at Bevel and the tight ends – while he was in Seattle. So he was the offensive coordinator in Seattle from 2013 through 2017. So that's five years or, or it was just the last five years that we saw Bevel in the league. Tight end target chair, 2017, 25%, 2016, 23%, 2015, 27%. 2014 was the only year that it was sub 20, 19 and a half percent. 2013 was 21 and a half percent. So four out of the five years, it was well above the NFL average in terms of tight end target share. So, I mean, you, you think back, and of course, it was Jimmy Graham in his prime, so those numbers are going to look really good. Like you said, he's one of the best tight ends we've seen over the last decade or so, um, you know, throughout this generation. So, of course, that's going to boost the numbers, and there weren't too many playmakers in Seattle's passing offense. But still, you know, he knows how to utilize the tight end when he has the talent there, and that top 10 draft capital says that, obviously, Hawkinson has the talent. So, I do agree with you that I think his floor, like, his floor is definitely going ignored for the fact that, if you do fade the position, right, and you end up in that, like, tight end 14 to 20 range, and you're like, shit, I need someone to be my every week starter, I feel like Hawkinson is going to have a great week-over-week week floor. And even if it's, like, three catches for 50 yards, that's better than what you're going to get for most tight ends. The only concern I do have, of course, is that, like, if you finish as tight end 12, you know, that it, that does nothing for your fantasy lineup, realistically, you know, because that's, that's not very hard to do. It, it, he's going to be a full-time player, right? He's going to come into this position and be a three-down – uh, snap guy, which is more than already 80% of the tight ends in the NFL. So I think that gives you a floor in the fact that, you know, you said he's going to be involved in the red zone by the goal line, but he's also someone that can beat linebackers, beat safeties, and he'll be involved, you know, from inside the twenties and outside the hashes and things like that. The concern of course, is that, uh, is the volume going to be there in the passing game? Are they going to go very run heavy? Um, and there are a lot of mouths to feed. There are a lot of people that I get excited about in this offense, right? It's like, oh, okay, Kenny Galladay is a fourth round pick. I like Marvin Jones to bounce back. I like Stafford as a late round sleeper. I love Carryon Johnson. The offensive line is good, but it's, realistically, this is going to be a team that pounds a rock, eats a lot of clock, and um, you know who who are you going to be comfortable using in your lineup from the passing game? So uh, I will say, like, I'm tempering expectations as we're moving into the summer for the passing game, but I think it's going to be an efficient one, and uh, I think. Hawkinson is going to surprise a lot of people and definitely finish inside the top 12 top eight. I could see it happen. If a couple things break, right. If he catches, you know, six touchdowns instead of four, that's the difference between being tight end 13 and being tight end nine, you know? So I'm, I'm with you on Hawkinson for sure. Yeah. They have a couple of wide receivers there who are probably going to see over a hundred targets and even carry on Johnson in the running games and get a bunch of looks. But Hawkinson, as you said, is a guy who's not only going to produce touchdowns where last year we saw Trey Burton finish in the top eight as well, but, He's a guy who you didn't want to start week in and week out because he didn't know when he was going to get in the end zone. And that's the only way he brought value. Hawkinson's an amazing receiver who can get like 60, 70 yards and not score. And that's good enough to be like a top 12 tight end on the week. So you don't have to bank on those like fluky touchdowns, which you can't really predict week to week. Facts. Let's get it. Next up, staying in division, the Chicago Bears. This one, uh, I have Tariq Cohen finishes outside the top 36 running backs in half PPR. I didn't want to go full PPR because he's obviously one of the best pass catching backs in the league. And um, in PPR leagues, those receptions are really valuable. I originally had it as outside the top 30, but he's being picked as the 28th running back off the board. And I didn't want to, I didn't think that was bold enough. 
but I still think 20 outside the top 36 is still um, a reasonable projection just because you look at what happened last year in the beginning of the season, all the talk was Matt Nagy loves to use a big running back and catch the ball like Kareem Hunt did. And you see what they did with Jordan Howard over the first couple of weeks of the season. He had 11 targets over the first three games in comparison to Cohen's eight. And you look at the snap share between them going into week four, um, Tariq Cohen just saw an average of 37.7% of the snaps where Jordan Howard was at 68.7. They really wanted to like work him in as a full three down back and get him involved in the passing game. But after those three weeks and they saw that like he wasn't productive and he couldn't catch the ball, that's when in week four, Tariq Cohen went up to a 48% snap share, like an 11% increase. And Jordan Howard went to 54%. He went down by 14.7%. Uh, and I have spl uh, splits of when Jordan Howard caught more than two balls, two or more balls. It was only four games, but Tariq Cohen was like extremely bad in those games. And three of the four in that split was over the first three games of the season. And you look, if he's not, if he's not catching the ball, He's not going to give you much on the ground either. He's not a guy who's going to be used in the red zone on the ground. He's not going to be a guy who's going to break away. Well, he will break away runs, but he's not going to get like 10 rushes a game. So all his uh, value is built on his receptions. And you can see that last year when he finishes a top 24 running back, in seven of those 10 games, he caught five or more balls. And his average receptions in those 10 games was 5.9 a game, which extrapolated out to a full season is 94 receptions. With the running backs they brought in this year with Mike Davis and free agency and David Montgomery, two guys who are bigger running backs than him, guys who can handle carries, guys who can play all three downs, Tariq Cohen's not going to be on pace to catch 94 balls. He's not even going to be – I'd be surprised if he finishes next year with 75 receptions, and that's where, like, a ton of his value is built off of. I think he had either 71 or 77 catches this year. I'm not too sure. He had 71. 71. Look at that. Look at that yeah. photographic memory. No, dude, it's funny that you brought up Tariq Cohen because – on if people are watching this on Tuesday, yesterday's video was literally like mid round running backs, and I was doing research on Terry Cohen for like two hours yesterday. So I have a lot of information like at hand on, on what you're talking mm -hmm. about, and I'm I'm completely with you. Uh, I wouldn't say I, I don't think he's going to finish outside of the top 36. Obviously, that's a bold prediction, but I'm with you on the fact that like I'm not drafting him anywhere near his fifth round ADP because you, you know I talk about this all the time. Just the scat backs, and there was you know. The, the weeks one through three where he didn't do much. Then there was weeks nine through 12 where he didn't do much. And then you look at weeks 15, 16, 17, and even into the divisional round of playoffs. That's what you get with these kind of backs. When you don't have the volume consistently, you're going to have patches where these guys don't really produce for you, right? And, and the problem with that is, you know, you're sitting him. So he's the fifth round pick. And then you realize he's going through a rough patch. You're probably sitting him for one, two, if not three of those games. And then what are you going to do? Like after three games that are really bad, you're just going to be like, you know what? I feel like starting Tariq Cohen in my lineup now. And that fourth game is the one he explodes in, but you definitely didn't have him in your lineup. So it's like, you know, you're playing this game of trying to figure out when to put a guy in a lineup. And that the same way you would discount a player for his injuries, right? You, you look at a guy who's injury risk and you're saying like, Oh, I'm kind of uh, banking him in my rankings as someone who's going to miss three games. Therefore I'm going to knock him down a round or two. It's the same thing with these scat backs because you're going to know that you're not going to want to play them for two or three games throughout the season. So I look at it as the same way I look at injury players. Um, the opportunity cost needs to drop these guys down a little bit. I still think he's going to be involved. But like you said, man, with Dave Montgomery and Mike Davis, they're both Jordan and Howard in that they have the same size. They can run the ball inside, yeah, <laughs> inside, outside, but they can catch the ball. So, like, when Matt Nagy is drawing up plays, he doesn't have to be one-dimensional. He's not like, ah, oh, fuck, I, I'm putting Jordan Howard on. He has to run the ball. Or now I have to take him off because he can't catch the ball. It's going to be, a, like, a trio, I think, of these guys, mostly David Montgomery and Tariq Cohen. But Tariq Cohen is probably not going to get anywhere near 100 rushes this year. I would say probably going to dip back down to, like, 65 or 70. A lot of those are going to go towards Mike Davis. He's going to get some passing work. So, I'm with you. I just think the volume is going to be down. And when you have, a, uh, you know, a pass catching back, who's not getting as much volume, you know, that week over week dimension of him, like he's not going to get goal line touches. He's not going to get a lot of red zone rushes. So, you know, you're banking on a guy who's going to get seven to eight touches, but not anywhere near the end zone. So, you know, it, it's, it's a really, it's a really tough um, situation to look at because he just came into his second year, like exploded, right? He had a, it had a monster year last year and you're like, this is good development. We're going to see him get better and better. But the situation is not good with the two running backs. Allen Robinson missed three games. Anthony Miller was basically playing with one shoulder for the entire season. Adam Shaheen, who's a red zone target, is uh, coming back. He missed basically the entire regular season. So um, Tariq Cohen is someone that you definitely need to temper expectations on. 
Yeah, heading into this year, I think he's kind of similar to like a Naheem Hines. Obviously, he's a little bit better than Hines, but we saw the splits with and without Marlon Mack last year, and he just wasn't as involved because even though Mack wasn't heavily involved in the passing game, he could get it done, and they just figured they'd have a guy who, when you put him out there, is not telegraphing what you're going to do. Like, Matt Nagy's a really good OC. He's not going to keep uh, Cohen out there like all three downs because they like the defense knows he's not a threat on the ground where Dave Montgomery and Mike Davis could do both run and pass the, or run and catch the ball. Yeah, um, it's going to be interesting to see what happens in Chicago this year because you just like I just don't see Tariq Cohen playing that many snaps out of the backfield. I mean, they could end up just using him as like a full time slot weapon receiver, which would be cool. But I just you know like how much volume is really going to be there for him? It'll be interesting to see. Plus with Anthony Miller back to like what should be a hundred percent, he's like their number one slot guy, and we both love him as like last year heading into the year. So I'm just not sure the volume is going to be there. And looking yeah. at guys who's being drafted around him, not the same position, but just like other players. Robbie Anderson, I'm very high on him, but would you take Robbie Anderson or Cohen? Like, all things being equal in your lineup, you could use either a running back or receiver. Uh, ooh, that's a really tough one. Uh, I would probably take Robbie Anderson if it's any – if it's if it's half PPR, I'd, I'd go Anderson, I think. Yeah, and Hunter Henry's there, uh, Sammy Watkins is around, a Cooper Cup. Like, other guys who have upside, but you also know, like, what their role is going to be. Whereas Cohen, we're not exactly sure, like, what percent of the snaps he's going to get and when he's yeah, going to – his ADP is shitty right now. It shouldn't be early 50s. It should be somewhere in, like, the 60s. He's a sixth or seventh round target, in my opinion. I like him in best ball, though, because, you know, obviously you don't have to – He has those huge games, yeah. Yeah, so it, that's the crazy part about, like, best ball compared to season long. It's like, their ADPs are around the same. But season long, there's so much more risk knowing that you have to actually choose when to sit and start him. So, um, yeah, Tariq Cohen right now, I'm not looking at anywhere near the fifth round. Seventh round, early seventh round is where I would start considering him. Yeah, I agree. I'll probably be on my board. Yeah, he and James White are kind of like in the same boat for me where I just – I'm not going to take a guy who I'm not sure when they're going to produce and I have to choose when and when not to start them. Who would you take out of those two? I think I would take Cohen just because he has at least something on the ground. Like James White, I'm not sure what he can do on the ground consistently. I think last year he scored like five rushing touchdowns, but that's not like who he is. Yeah, that's – I think that was a, actually a question I asked in yesterday's video too because I was trying to think of it. I was like, you know, better offense for James White, but – better player in Tariq Cohen, and I would take Tariq Cohen too because neither of them are going to score anywhere near the five rushing touchdowns that James White scored last year. So I'll, I'll take the guy who's actually capable of making big plays. Yeah. All right, moving out of division, we're going to the NFC East. Before this you do, before yeah. you do let's, it's plug season. Let's plug a few things. One, let's hit go. that thumbs up button if you are enjoying the video thus far. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you're new. We're breaking down everything 2019 fantasy football five days a week for the entire summer and then into the season. And uh, go cop the draft guide, bigdogsdraftguide.com. I I believe it's up there somewhere. Last Uh, week I pointed at it and I pointed the wrong way, so I think it's this way now. Dude, I do that consistently now. I think – oh, you know why? Because – It's flipped, I think. I'm not sure how it screen records for you because for me right now, I'm on the right side and you're on the left side to me and it might be different. I have it vertical. Let me see. So it should be over here. All right, I did it both ways, so at least one of them is going to be right. Uh, okay, well, either way, just fucking go to bigdogsdraftguide.com. Don't type, <laughs> don't type it in backwards, and you'll be fine. So, you know, we break down the big facts on the channel, and we give you tons and tons and tons of free content. Uh, if, if you want, like, the absolute best content that we put out, nicely, neatly organized, packaged into one website, it will be on bigdogsdraftguide.com. It is accessible via phone, via tablet, via computer, laptop, whatever you need. To print out the rankings. It's got our big board rankings. It's got positional rankings by tiers, sleepers, bust, must draft players, tons of tools, market share tools, all this good shit. So go check it out, bigdogsdraftguide.com. If you did cop the draft guide, make sure you uh, drop a comment down below. Let me know what you think about it. If you have any uh, feedback, comments, concerns, questions, whatever, let's get into our NFC Eve Bowl predictions. That's Before that, guide. I want to touch on the draft guide. <clears throat> Completely unbiased. It's, like, beautiful. It's, like, so, as- like, aesthetic, and it's got so much, like, in-depth information. What is it, twenty nine ninety seven? Yeah. Like, that's, like, five cheeseburgers at, like, McDonald's. Just, like, <laughs> go, on a, go on a five-day yeah. diet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and just cop the draft guide. It's got, like, so much information. It's got a ton of shit in there. Nick put in a ton of work, and you can obviously tell that through what he wrote and all the in-depth stuff. So, uh, if you haven't already, check it out. It's It's pretty much what we do on here, but, like, in written form and, like, a lot more players. So. Yeah, it was uh, a lot of work went into it, but it, I'm really happy with how it came out. And uh, the feedback that I've gotten so far is very good. So you guys keep giving me feedback, and I'll keep adding and updating it throughout the entire summer. So go cop it, NFC East. Let's talk. All right, New York Giants, Saquon Barkley finishes outside the top five running backs in standard and half PPR, not full point PPR. 
And the reason why is it's, it's not the best correlation to draw, but his situation heading into this year is very similar to what David Johnson was having heading into last year. We look at the quarterback play, the difference between Eli Manning going into this year and Sam Bradford. I'm using his 2016 numbers because that's the last time he was like healthy. So that's like the last season going into last year. Completion percentage was obviously in Bradford's favor. I think he set a record that year. Um, yards per attempt were 0.5 less for Bradford, but then everything else was basically the same except for the interception percentage where uh, Eli Manning turned it over a lot more. And we know Sam Bradford uh, is kind of scared to throw the ball downfield. And Eli Manning really doesn't have that juice anymore. And I just think this is an offense in New York where they did add a few pieces of their offensive line. They got Kevin Zeitler and um, somebody was injured last year. Nate Solder, or he just played terribly, one of the two. And then they also have a rookie from last year, Will, uh, Will Hernandez. They have a better offensive line than what the Cardinals had last year because it was decimated by injuries. But it's not a good offensive line. They don't have anybody who can really stretch the field outside of their tight end. Like, they have two slot receivers as their two top receivers, which Mm -hmm. isn't going to help move the ball. Um, Whereas the Cardinals, at least they had Christian Kirk who could help move the ball. And I know he was a rookie and all, but he did pretty well um, for, like, the situation he was thrown into. And just the time possession they had last year, the G-men ranked 28th. Arizona was 32nd last year. We saw how much that hurt David Johnson. There was a game, I think it was against the Rams, where they didn't get past, like, the opponent's 40-yard line until, like, the fourth quarter. It was, like, something ridiculous. I'm sure, like, one of you guys knows it. But, like, there was an offense that just couldn't move the ball. And I'm not sure outside of Saquon Barkley, there's one player on this team who can really break a big play and move the ball over midfield consistently, especially if they bring in Daniel Jones and throw him into the fire halfway through the season. I just – I like to grab running backs who are on good offenses. And you look at, like, Christian McCaffrey, Ezekiel Elliott – Uh, Alvin Kamara, Melvin Gordon, these are guys who are in good offenses and they're being picked very high. And I think a lot of the value is tethered to how well and how often a team can get into scoring positions. And we saw last year, Barkley scored 15 touchdowns. Just seven of them came from inside the 10 yard line. Five of his 15 came from 50 plus yards out. And he's an athletic freak and he breaks a bunch of big plays. But can we really expect a third of the guy's touchdowns to come from 50 yards out year in and year out? Those are like I, I think you said one time that uh, Todd Gurley only had one rush of 40-plus yards. No, he had, he had zero. Todd so, Gurley had last year. All, every single rushing touchdown he had last year, which I think was 17 maybe, came inside the red zone, every single one of them. Yeah, uh, I, yeah, 15 of 21 came from inside the 10. So I'm having a really tough time with Barkley this year. I'm, what I'm praying is I don't have any picks within the top two because I'm with you. Like, I, w- I went through enough emotional tragedy with David Johnson last year that I don't want to have to deal with that in a bad offense. So I'm hoping I don't – I'm not on the clock where I'm like, fuck, do I want to take Saquon Barkley or do I want to take Zeke? I'm hoping, I, you know, someone else takes Saquon before I do. Um, someone – obviously, the easy one-on-one in Dynasty, but when it comes to redraft, like we said, it's a bad team. I do – I wrestle with the fact that I, I just think Saquon Barkley is just so He's fucking awesome. – out of the range of spectrums where, you know, everyone like talks about regression, this regression, that he can't do it again, blah, blah, blah. But like just watching Saquon Barkley in his rookie season, just absolutely shred guys and dominate the NFL in a way that we haven't seen since, you know, a Barry Sanders esque type player. It makes me think that like, you know, Oh, like seven of his touchdowns, whatever came from 40 yards out. I'm like, I think, I realistically think Squan Barkley is going to do that every single year. Like I do. It's not smart, right? Like you wouldn't, that's, that's not like a, a thing that should happen, but I just think he's so good. He's so fast. He's so big that I do think it's going to happen. And that, that's my hesitation is like it, Squan Barkley is going to make plays of 40 plus yards almost weekly. And I want that in my lineup, but again, you're right. Like this, how many scoring opportunities are we going to get? How much time of possession is this offense really going to have? You know, you don't want to be sitting there into the third quarter and the Giants have scored three points and you're like, fuck, like, I, you know, it's a Quan Barkley. But at the end of the day, um, the Cowboys, the Saints are going to have, you know, five scoring opportunities a game, if not, you know, six, seven, whatever, in a good game. So it's something I've wrestled with. And uh, in standard, I have Zeke as my one in my rankings. In half PPR, I think I took Barkley. And in full PPR, I have uh, McCaffrey. I think I have C-Mac, yeah. So Barkley's not my 101 in all league types. But for half PPR, it's like, dude, I, I don't want to fade Barkley and then look back and be like, yeah, we knew what Saquon Barkley was. Like, how could you possibly fade this guy, you know? Yeah, I'm not fading. If I have a top four pick, I'd still, like, take him at the 101 just because he's so safe. He's going to have, like, 85-plus receptions. I think he had 91 last year as a rookie. And yeah. the thing you brought up is, like, this offense might not be good or whatever. 
and the argument you can make is last year they weren't good either. Like, look yeah, at them. The, yeah, that's the other thing. It's like, it, you know what? Oh, he may, like, he can't do 40 plus yard runs like every other game or something coming into this year with his bad offense. I'm like, bro, the offense was fucking yeah. trash last year. And their offensive line got better with Kevin Zeitler coming in. Um, so, I mean, there's arguments for and against. I think you could make, like, I mean, we're good at finessing the big facts. I, we can make very good arguments for or against him right now. So I'm having trouble, and I'm kind of hoping I'm just not in a position in any of my season-long leagues where I actually have to choose between Barkley and, um, you know, like a- anyone else at the top there. Yeah, you would obviously agree there's, like, no chance he falls outside the top 10 by season's end, right? In, like, any format, just, like, fantasy. Like top running backs? Yeah, like, there's no chance. No, if he's a, I, if, I think if he plays a full 16, I, like, I can't imagine him falling outside of the top five. Yeah, that's, that's why I did a, a bold prediction, because you look at the other running backs around there, like, uh, obviously, the other three in the top four have, like, a very good chance of finishing top five. Melvin Gordon, if he stays healthy. David Johnson, if that offense is good. Um, even Nick Chubb, just how many opportunities Carlos Hyde on the, had on the goal line last year. He could score, like, 15 touchdowns. Like, I'm not yeah. sure that's that's too bold of a prediction for uh, Nick Chubb to produce like that. Um, so, if those guys do produce and stay healthy, Barkley could finish outside the top five, but I'm not banking on it, and I'd still feel comfortable taking him inside the top four picks, even at 101. Yeah, for sure. Staying in the division, Philadelphia Eagles. I think heading into 2020, Zach Ertz will fall outside the top five tight ends selected. And as for what that means this season, I don't think he's – So the prediction is like next year's ADP, Ertz won't be a top five guy. Yeah. And I think that's because we'll see signs this year of not a changing of the guard, but kind of implementing Dallas Goddard into the offense a little bit more and Zach Ertz taking kind of a step back. Not something where he's going to fall – outside the top five this year, but maybe heading into next year um, with emerging weapons, he's not going to be the tight end that we see this year. Let me ask you something. Someone uh, DM me a question on, I don't remember if it was on Patreon or Twitter or where. It was a really good question. So it's a standard lead. He said, would you rather have Kelsey and Adam Thielen or OBJ and Zach Ertz? This season? Now, yeah, like for – say it's a standard redraft league, and I was like, wow, you know what? It's like I, I went through every player, and I'm like, okay, Kelsey's going to be a monster in standard because he's going to score, you know, 13 touchdowns probably. But then I'm like, Adam Thielen, like, ew, do I want him in any standard league? Probably not. And then I look at the other side, I'm like, oh, you know what? OBJ and Zach Ertz, those are two elite guys at their position. And I'm like, Z- I do think Zach Ertz is going to take a little bit of a step back. How good is he in a standard league? Like he was so good last year because he caught – what did he catch, like 100 games? Mm-hmm. Oh, I thought you were talking touchdowns. I think he had 116 catches and he had eight touchdowns. Catches, right? Yeah, he had like a, I think he set the tight end record or whatever for receptions in a season, which is fucking phenomenal for a tight end. But, you know, even if he catches that in a non PPR league, you know, and uh, OBJ, of course, you like him a lot. But realistically, like season end numbers, what, what do you think uh, Adam Thielen's yardage total is going to be? Well, I know. I haven't really looked into their offense about like how you bring up that they're going to want to run more, but I think he's going to at least see 1,100 receiving yards. Like that's I think I'm that's saying, like 11, 1150, 1200. Um, he'll probably score seven to eight touchdowns. I'm like, okay, like I like OBJ a lot more, but realistically, what is OBJ going to finish with? You know, 13, 1400, and around maybe the same. Yeah, if he stays time. healthy too, and it's yeah. a new offense that he has to adjust to. So yeah, I would honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if OBJ like if we're all just looking too hard into the situation and it just ends up being OBJ, you know, 110 catches, 1700 yards, and like 15 touchdowns. He's awesome. But, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if that happened. But like, I mean, Vegas, the over under for uh, what they have for OBJ is, I think, around that. It's like uh, 1199 receiving yards and eight and a half as his over under for touchdowns. So if we're trying to be like unbiased and, and realistic here. I said uh, I would rather have. Kelsey and – or actually, I don't remember what I answered, to be honest. But now that I'm thinking about it, I'd probably rather have Kelsey and, and Thielen. And That's where I'm leaning. Just because Kelsey's going to be that number one, like, unquestioned. Because we know Tyreek Hill's going to get – well, we don't know. But I'm assuming he gets at least four games. And he's going to be the number one, like, unquestioned four, four games. And even, like, they had Tyreek Hill all of last season, and he was a monster. He's pretty much, like, a top five wide receiver. So, I would in, take him. So yeah. in, in normal league, like half PPR or PPR, Kelsey still has a monster advantage over all the tight ends. But in standard, I, I feel like the gap is just enormous. And, yeah, if, if Tyreek Hill misses four games, we could see Travis Kelsey score five or six touchdowns within those first four weeks and, like, absolutely just, like, win you three of those four games, you know. So I'm, I'm kind of siding towards Kelsey here just because I feel like the OBJ unknown is a little too heavy for me. Yeah, but and I, you bring you bring up the yeah. touchdown disparity at tight end. And that's kind of funny because I got, I got a little big fact here for – Zach Ertz. Um, What's going on? I said keep on rolling. Oh, uh, all right. Uh, 
spilling on myself. <laughs> it's got a drinking problem. It's the 4th of July. It's all right. We'll, we'll give him a pass. So we look at Zach Ertz. Before, like these past two seasons, he's had 16 receiving touchdowns, eight in each year. If you can remember before that, he was never like a touchdown threat. He had 11 touchdowns over his four, first four seasons in the league. And it's not like he wasn't getting volume. He had 89 or more targets in three of those four years and over 100 twice. It's just the fact that I was trying to look up like what the difference was between these two years and what they had uh, those four years prior when he wasn't getting into the end zone. And as I already said, he like he was getting the volume that like a tight end one would get. I think it comes down to the fact that they haven't really had a rushing, like a good rushing attack recently. Over the past two years, they've had 21 rushing touchdowns, 12 and nine. And then over those other four years when he wasn't getting into the end zone, they had 16, 15, 16, 19. And a lot of those come in the red zone. And Zach Ertz is a guy who makes his, like, makes his hay. I'll use that saying again. He makes his hay off of touchdowns in the red zone. Only one came from outside the red zone in these past two years, and it was a 23-yard catch. He's the fourth most red zone targets these past two years behind only Devonta Adams, Kelsey, and Michael Thomas. And I'm just not sure with Alshon Jeffrey playing a full 16, and even if he doesn't, J.J. Arcega Whiteside is there. Um, I'm not sure that the red zone receptions or the red zone targets are going to be as high as they were these past two seasons, especially after bringing in Jordan Howard, who he's not a great running back, but he's a guy who can tip over and fall into the end zone. They bring in Miles Sanders in the third oh, round. Look at cow. <laughs> I think yeah, cows, a there are a lot of weapons there, man. Yeah, cows have better hands than him, even though they have hooves. So I don't, <laughs> I don't know. Got hooves. <laughs> Gotta make a t-shirt. Actually, I'm not sure how that would go over. Um, uh, Miles Sanders. You could, a, you could put a cow on it and then just put Jordan Howard's face as, like, the cow head. <laughs> Eagles fans would hate that. <laughs> yeah, be fucking big mad. Yeah, and then obviously Miles Sanders comes in. So I think they'll obviously score a little bit more on the ground this year inside the red zone, which will just take away from his volume. And I'm not saying he's not going to get, like, 90 receptions this year. I think that's likely in his range of outcomes. I just think with the type of receivers that they have, like Deshaun Jackson going downfield who – I think you said his over-under is like 90 and a half receiving yards. Alshon Jeffrey, a big body. 900, yeah. 900, yeah. And Alshon Jeffrey being a big body wide receiver. And J.J. Arcega Whiteside, who in college, like, had the highest contested catch rate. They just have a bunch of guys who can produce in the red zone. I'm not sure Zach Ertz is going to really have the same touchdown production as this year. And we see Dallas Goddard step into, like, a bigger role and kind of push him out of the top five heading into next year, especially with all the good young emerging tight ends. Yeah, um, I I'm with you there. I, th- I feel like it's going to be tough for him to replicate that touchdown total. I, I think at the end of the day, he is the best receiver on that entire team, you know, uh, of the Eagles. He has the best hands, probably arguably runs the best routes, um, and that will play itself out. But, yeah, I don't think he's going to get enough volume down there. I will say, though, like, it was kind of the same with Kelsey. Like, that was his argument for the first few years. I think he scored, like, four, then five, then five touchdowns. And, like, the guy just can't get into the end zone. And then all of a sudden, you know, then he's exploded over the last couple of years. But he also didn't really have anything to um, compete with uh, like Zach Ertz did now, you know. So it's like um, it, there's it's a lot. Dwayne of, Never forget Dwayne Bow. Dwayne Goat. Love that. Um, yeah, what fucking happened to Dwayne Bow, man? Uh, I just remember one season, like, no Chiefs receiver caught a touchdown. It was pretty pathetic. Yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah, that was crazy. How the fuck did that happen? Because you had yeah. Alex Smith at the home. How the tables have turned. Um yeah, Ertz, is just, there's just so many – they brought in so many weapons and they're getting players back from um, injury and it, it's going to be spread around a lot. So it, it's tough to see the volume be there for Ertz. I, I'm, I'm just, he'll still be wildly efficient. But if, like, one of the guys underneath him, you know, if it's Hunter Henry or if it's O.J. Howard, has, like, somewhat of an efficient year and goes a little bit over their, like, career norms efficiency-wise and they get a little more volume – I could easily see one of them, you know, jumping over Ertz in the rankings and then eventually pushing him out because of Dallas Goddard's um, more involvement down there. So, yeah, I'm, uh, I-, I could see this happening. Yeah, and they want to use more two tight end sets. They already led the league in two-plus tight end sets on passing plays last year. So this just, like, further eats away at his volume. I don't think he's going to come close to matching his 116 receptions uh, next year. Yeah, should be tough. Yeah, moving into the NFC South, we have the Carolina Panthers, and my bold prediction is Curtis Samuel, the current wide receiver 39 off the board, outscores DJ Moore, who is wide receiver 24. So he's in that wide receiver two range. And the thing about Curtis Samuel is when you think of Curtis Samuel, Nick, like what do you think of his size? Just not even looking at it, like do you think 
he's a big receiver, a small receiver. Well, he's obviously a small receiver, but like how small do you think he is? I think it's small. Um, I mean, based on the question, I'm assuming he's probably bigger than I, I imagine. I would have said like, I mean, you think of Samuel, you think of weapon, you think of Percy Harvin size. So I would have said like, you know, five, nine, five, 10, maybe, and 180 pounds, 85. Let me see it right now. I'm pretty sure I should have had this up. Uh, he, well, I know he's 5'11". I just want to see his weight. I think he's uh, 196. So he, he's a lot bigger than I initially thought. He was like, I thought he was 5'9", like 180. Yeah, he exactly. Is, That's what you think of when you think of a player. 5'11", 196, yeah. Yeah, so he's a lot bigger than I thought. And obviously, DJ Moore is like pretty big. He's six foot, but like two, probably 2'10", 212. Yeah. He's built like a running back. The thing about these two guys is their skill sets aren't all too far off. And I'll throw up like the reception perception reception perception thing for Curtis Samuel, like how good of a receiver he actually is. Like yeah, I know Matt Harmon loved him. In yeah, that. he like all his things were like green or like yellow green or whatever you want to call it. Like on his like how often he wins on different routes. He's more of a complete receiver than DJ Moore is at this point in his career because DJ Moore usually works in like uh, the like the short intermediate game where he makes a lot of his yards after the catch, whereas Curtis Samuel, when he started playing, he was really beating everybody with his speed and just his his finesse on his routes. And you look at when he finally started to get on the field, it was week 12. That's the first time he topped a 40% snap share, and that's when Funchess was, like, taken out of the offense. Over those next couple of games, his uh, projection for the year was 59 catches, 840 yards, five touchdowns with 112 targets. In that same span, Moore was on pace for 115 targets, so just three more. It's, it's not like a wide receiver one, wide receiver two situation in my eyes. It's more of like a 1A, 1B, where both guys can like get fed because they really don't have a third receiver in that receiving game. It's kind of like what we see in Minnesota where there isn't like an alpha. It's two really good receivers. Yeah. And obviously, like both of them aren't as good as the two guys in Minnesota. But um, considering like what he had to go through playing with Cam Newton with a bum shoulder, um, Taylor Heinke and Garrett Gilbert, and then even in week 17, he only played 56% of the snaps. The fact that he produced as well as he did despite like all these downfalls, it just like shows how good of a receiver he really is. And now with Cam Newton having a full off season to kind of prepare and just get healthy doing all these, like, I don't even know, like offering $5,000 to a guy in like first class to take his seat and like not having sex for a month, like just like all these like weird junk science things he's doing. If he gets back anywhere near he was last year, I think he'll have Curtis Hamill will have the volume to produce inside the top 30 receiver and kind of challenge DJ Moore. And one thing, that kind of surprised me looking at the consistency of these two receivers last year, their top 24 finishes, both only finished as top 24 in a week, three times, but uh, Samuel only played 13 games. And as I said before, he didn't play 40% of the snaps until week 12. So DJ Moore was only like a top 24 receiver, 18% of the time wide receiver three or better finishes. DJ Moore did it five times. Curtis Samuel did it seven in much less games and much less timeshare played 266 less snaps. So all in all, I don't think DJ Moore is going to be – not that he was bad last year, but I think he'll obviously improve heading into his second year. But I think as Samuel has a full year to really show his talent and be that, like, 1B to DJ Moore's 1A and his, like, higher A dot and uh, air yards and stuff, I think he could uh, come close to outproducing DJ Moore. Samuel, dude, I wish we got to see him his rookie year. Like, he missed his entire rookie season. We would know so much more about him, obviously. Mm-hmm. My, I, I'm wondering, well, one, I'm going to actually check while we're talking about it right now, um, personal grouping frequency. How do you think this offense sets up? Like, do you think – DJ Moore is obviously going to play the outside the majority. Do you think Samuels goes into the slot and Chris Hogan he, is the outside, or do you think he's uh, an outside guy too? I looked at it. I think he only played like 20-something percent of his snaps in the slot, and DJ Moore is around 30%. They had Jarius Wright in the slot a lot, so – Maybe DJ Moore, just because he's really good in the short and intermediate part of the game, but he's also very explosive to, like, take them up the seam. Maybe he works more out of the slot. And so do you think in, in two wide receiver sets, I'm, I'm looking at it right now, they ran two wide receiver sets on um, – okay, so they actually ran three wide receiver sets on 55%. The rest of their plays were either two wide receivers or one wide receiver. So almost, you know, almost like half their plays came with uh, – less than three wide receivers on the, on the field. So my concern is like, I mean, we see dumb NFL coaching all the time, right? So if they don't view Curtis Samuel as an outside guy, you know, does he come off the field when they're in two wide receiver sets? Well, he's just like very heavily on the outside. So I think, I don't think he'll have a, like a problem taking that away from Chris Hogan, who did like absolutely nothing last year. So yeah. I, I just, like the NFL coach, coaches yeah. are just really dumb. So it's like, oh, Chris Hogan's tall. So let's take Samuel <laughs> off the field when 
uh, we're running two wide receiver sets and then put him back on the field when we use a slot guy, you know? So, yeah, I mean, if they're using him on the outside, then I'm all for that. And uh, he could, he could absolutely have a monster year based on all the efficiency uh, metrics and stuff that you pointed out. And the fact that he was, you know, pacing out just as good, if not better than DJ Moore had more top 24 finishes or top 36 finishes and around the same top 24. Um, I, I just think, you know, there's always going to be this stigma about these smaller guys or about mm -hmm. these like, you know, guys who boom bust or whatever, because you always want to see that alpha wide receiver and you don't feel comfortable buying into it unless you get that. But the way today's NFL works is, I mean, this whole Carolina offense, man, like look at their playmakers, C-Mac, DJ Moore, um, Curtis Samuel, none of them are big alpha guys at all. And, you know, they're, they're buying into that kind of system. So um, Samuel's definitely a guy that we need to have on our radars going, you know, double digit rounds, if, if not later. So he's a guy that I'll be trying to get on, on, you know, one or two of my teams this year for sure. Yeah, I feel like this would be like a perfect example of like when to use a blind resume, because the question I asked you in the beginning was kind of like vague, like, do you think he's big or small? But I think if you put their like measurables up next to one another, like he's an inch shorter and like 10 pounds lighter. I think if you just look at the names, DJ Moore and Curtis Samuel, you don't think that you think Curtis Samuel is a lot smaller than DJ Moore is when in reality yeah. it's not as far apart. So, And just another thing to point out, I found it interesting. Moore played 266 more snaps than Curtis Samuel. He had one less red zone target, four less deep targets, and just 51 more air yards. So he wow. was he was being used in the red zone more. Like I'm I'm not sure if that's gonna uh, like a sticky stat where it's gonna stay until next year, but it just shows the confidence that they had in him last year to be this like all around weapon, despite like what we may think of him. Yeah, it, it's so hard to get a grasp on the offense because one, like Cam Shoulder was obviously fucked up for a large portion of the year, and two, like these guys didn't start playing significant snaps until halfway through the year, if not, you know, three quarters through the year for Samuels, case in point. And you saw, you know, I've dropped this stat a bunch of times that Cam Newton's adjusted completion percentage, which takes away throwaways and, you know, things like that, was the highest of his career last year by far. But that came at the expense of his average depth of target, which was the lowest uh, of his career by far because he was dumping it off the C-Mac so much. But I think that has to do with his shoulder a lot. So, you know, uh, coming off this shoulder surgery, he's got more time to recover from. He's already throwing full-size football and he's throwing and stuff, and he should be ready for the NFL season, you know, barring any setbacks. So, this year, do we see a more comfortable cam throwing the ball deep, throwing the ball more downfield, a few less dump offs from C-Mac and a few more throws to DJ Moore, Curtis Samuel, you know, who gets those throws? That's the thing. And maybe both of them get the throws and maybe both of them are actually better than some people um, are kind of pegging them now. So I'm, I'm, I'm very intrigued by what happens in this offense. Yeah. And just one more point to like not detract from uh, DJ Moore, just to like show what happened last year. He was the only receiver with less than 1,020 receiving yards to have over 400 yards after the catch. And 52.3% of his yards came after the catch, which I'm not yeah, sure if that's that, a sticky stat, but that's like... Uh, I would say that is a sticky stat for a guy like him because that was like one of his biggest strong points. Uh, as he's a like a running back out there. He's like really good after the catch. It's ridiculous. Yeah, he's amazing after the catch. So like people say it's not a sticky stat, but I mean, that was... Juju was amazing at that in college, and then he was top five in the NFL's rookie year, top five again last year. So, like, if you're good after the catch, you will probably do that year over year and make plays after the catch. So, yeah, I'm uh, DJ Moore. That's the other thing, too. It's like, you know, if they give some of those short throws, if they do more screen passes towards DJ Moore, which they should, and let Curtis Samuel operate as more of a deep threat, I think that could be a really interesting dynamic and let DJ Moore, you know, um, rack up receptions, maybe like 75, 80 receptions, let him make plays after the catch and have Curtis Samuel kind of operate as the deep guy or almost like a, I don't want to say a Steve Smith um, prototype, like what he did in Carolina. But I think both of them have a little bit of that game to them. Yeah. That's an offense. Like I'm really excited to see this year. Like even if they use like Ian Thomas more than Greg Olson, like Greg Olson will probably be in the booth talking about like what Carolina is doing while they're playing. So that's yeah. an offense with a bunch of playmakers who are like awesome after the catch and obviously McCaffrey. So yeah, I'm really excited to watch Carolina. I'm really next, excited for you to get to the next bowl prediction. <laughs> next up, this one is this one's a doozy. San Francisco 49ers, Jalen Hurd, their third round pick this year, leads the team in rushing touchdowns. This he was drafted as a wide receiver, so this might sound a little foolish, but you look at who he was in college. He played running back two years at Tennessee. He started over Alvin Kamara. He had let me see how many touchdowns. I think he had 20 as um, during his time at Tennessee. Actually, three years as a running back. He had five touchdowns, 12 touchdowns, three touchdowns. And he's a dude with a massive frame. He's 6'5", 226. So his BMI is a little low. But I'm not trying to tackle a guy who is the size of, like, Julio Jones just running at me from two yards away. And you look at the running backs that they have in this backfield. We brought it up before. They're all, like, 203 pounds. We have Jarek McKinnon, who's, like, 205. We have 
uh, Tevin Coleman, who's the low 200s, and we have Matt Breida, who's sub 200 pounds. None of these guys, even Coleman, haven't dominated a team's running attempts inside the five-yard line. Last year without Devonta Freeman, he only saw – Tevin Coleman only saw 42% of the runs inside the five while splitting a backfield or, like, having to share a backfield with Ito Smith, which obviously isn't something you look for with – like, Ito Smith is a smaller running back who's more of a scat back. Um, Matt Breida last year, despite being, like, the obvious number one in that backfield, only saw 33% of the rushes inside the five, where Alfred Morris saw 44% even though he wasn't like a good running back at all. And we all know Jarek McKinnon, sure, he has a higher BMI, but he's never been a guy who dominated goal line looks. And I think just Jalen Jalen Hurd, you don't pick a, a wide receiver, like a, a slot wide receiver who runs a 4-7 in the third round to use him as a slot receiver in the NFL. Kyle Shanahan showed he loves versatility by taking Debo Samuel this year and uh, Dante Pettis last year. I think he's going to be very like creative with how he uses Jalen Hurd. And that might be like – he uses him on the goal line just because he's got that big frame and he saw what he could do in college. So I don't, this one's kind of a far stretch, but I don't think it's out of the realm of possibilities that he drafted him in the third round to use him in an, like in a skill set where he is used on the goal line. Yeah. I think I, I I'm, I'm not like looking to draft Jalen Hurd anywhere. I think I would have liked his bold prediction more if you said that he, um, he led the league, he led the team in total touchdowns rather than rushing touchdowns because obviously he's very versatile. So I think in the goal line, maybe he won't always line up as the running back, but I could totally see him in like two tight end sets where George Kittle and him are kind of running up the middle um, or running routes over the middle against the safeties and linebackers. Uh, it's going to be definitely an interesting offense as well. This year. There's so many intriguing storylines going into the 2019 season, man. I, and I, I'm so I don't excited know if, for 2019. It's ridiculous. Dude, I don't know if it's because we, like, got into content, like, as soon as the last season ended, or I feel like this is actually, like, a really fucking, like, fun year to be paying attention to the NFL in, in the amount of depth that we are. But um, it's going to be really, really, really fun. And uh, we still got, like, two months before the NFL actually kicks off. Actually, I think it's the way that, like, the NFL is trending, too, because we're kind of moving away from, like, those six five wide receivers. We're looking for, like, playmakers and guys in the backfield who can catch the ball. It's just everybody's so dynamic nowadays that it's, like, so much fun to watch. There's, so, there's such a big player pool compared to what it was prior to it, right? There could be, like, five guys on offense that are really exciting to watch and that coaches are finally going to use them in the correct way. But yeah, that, that probably makes sense, too. Um, as far as – have we seen Kyle Shanahan ever utilize a guy like Jalen Hurd before? I don't think so at all. I don't think there's been really a guy like Jalen Hurd. Yeah, I mean, we definitely didn't have it in Atlanta um, when he was there. And where was he before that? The Redskins? Yeah, he was. Pierre Garçon okay. was like his wide receiver one. So Yeah, it could be like a, a Jordan Reed type, even though he's bigger than Jordan Reed. Um, they said they want him to like put on weight. So I don't know if he's going to move into that tight end role. So I, who knows? But he's a versatile player who could be used like all over the field. Definitely versatile. Yeah, I mean, the fact that they use such high draft capital on him is like they had some kind of plan for him. Not sure what it's going to be, but I'm sure it's going to be all over the field. That's the yeah, only thing. It's going to be interesting to say the least. Yeah. Last up, last bull prediction, Arizona Cardinals. Larry Fitzgerald finishes as a top 20 wide receiver in PPR and half PPR, maybe even standard. I don't play standard, so I don't really know like where guys finish around there. But I'm here, I'm here for this. Last year, guess what his fantasy finish was last year, if not, you're not looking at, like, the notes or whatever, in PPR leagues? 31. 25. Really? Yeah. It was – I used, like, fantasy pros where they finished, not by um, points per game, but just, like, total finish. Oh, he had a bad year, but it wasn't awful. Like, he had over 700 yards. I think he had seven total touchdowns because he threw one. But despite playing with a rookie quarterback, despite playing under Mike McCoy, like – it was a terrible offense, terrible situation, and he's still kind of produced. Like, he's not a guy you're going to throw into your lineup every week, but he's a guy who, if you needed a flex play, you could at least throw him in there. And now they bring in Kyler Murray. You bring in Cliff Kingsbury, who we don't really know what to expect out of him. He wants to run 90 plays a game. But everything I've heard is that he wants, like, a quick, fast-paced offense, and that's where Larry Fitzgerald operates. He's in the slot. He's a big target for him. They don't have a tight end of consequence. Hakeem Butler is the only big receiver, but he's still fighting for the wide receiver four spot. He could be used over the middle heavily, heavily targeted by Kyler Murray. He's a guy who had over 100 receptions the three years prior, three years in a row prior to last season. I could see him flirting with like 85 catches, even if uh, Christian Kirk has a breakout year, just because last year they had some like such terrible and low volume. They had un over 100 less uh, throwing attempts last year than the year prior and over 150 less than two years prior. And just even if Kyler Murray is a sliver better, 
than Josh Rosen, just how dynamic he is. I think it opens up this whole offense and we see kind of like a revitalized Larry Fitzgerald, even at the age of like 35. Yeah, dude, I'm so, I'm so into that. I feel like Fitz and Kirk are both going to have monster years, especially in PPR leagues. And I really, I think we're going to see more, like it, it, everyone is, you know, ready to jump back into the Cardinals bandwagon. Like, and, and they're like, Oh, let's forget about last year. But if that's the case, then forget about it for Larry Fitzgerald too. And like you said, he didn't even finish that poorly. He was almost a wider, a backhand wide receiver too in PPR league. I would imagine, I think he's going to have more like six for 65 games than he is not going to. I think that's going to be like the majority of his games. There's going to be so many times where a rookie quarterback like Kyler is going to depend on Larry Fitz. Like he knows how good Larry Fitz is. And like you said, he has probably the, watched him like all his life growing up. That's like the funny thing. Exactly. Right. And he's like the big body wide receiver there. Um, it, he'll be running in the slot more like Kirk is going to be the more downfield guy, which is why I think he'll have way more like big games and boom games. But Larry Fitz is going to consistently, I think like he'll have a weekly floor of five for 50. I think, and that's, you know, in a PPR league, 10 points for someone you're getting in like the fucking 13th round is phenomenal. And there's going to be a lot of times with his offensive line that Kyler is scrambling and needs to hit a target quickly before he gets fucking smacked by all these defenders coming at him. Who's going to be there? It's going to be Larry Fitz running these short routes over the middle. So it wouldn't be surprise. It wouldn't surprise me whatsoever if he finished, if Larry Fitz finished inside the top 15 in terms of just target volume and he doesn't drop passes. Right. So he's going to catch a large majority of those. I forget where I saw, I see this stat every year. Larry Fitzgerald has more in his career he has more tackles I saw that. than he drop fucking passes. That's ridiculous. It's absurd. That's the most. That's that's got to be the craziest stat you could find if you're doing NFL research. But dude, Larry, yeah, there's nothing about his game last year, Larry Fitz's game, that tell that says that he fell off. Other than the old age and the and the poor stats, only was the result of of this offense being so he, poor. He had a hamstring injury too, right, in the beginning of the season. Yeah, yeah, that lingered throughout, and it was like uh, – I, I remember that, yeah, because some of his snaps kind of got diminished. But, like, if he's a full-time player this year, Fitz is, is going to – he's absolutely in for a bounce back this year. So do not overlook him in – don't even overlook him in half PPR leagues. I think he'll be able to give you high-end wide receiver three, probably wide receiver two value in those leagues. Scoring touchdowns is definitely going to be um, something I – don't, I don't know if I could really peg him for more than, you know, five and a half as the over-under. But I, I think, like, the catch holes and the reception totals are going to be – up there yeah he well he is used heavily in the red zone he had 34 red zone targets over these past two years so if they do get in the red zone they don't really have a big body receiver I'm sure David Johnson's gonna obviously have some positive regression or whatever to like score more rushing touchdowns in the red zone but mm -hmm. he's he's easily the biggest target and he's shown in the past he had a season where he had like 100 something catches and like nine touchdowns I think he could like your over under is fair but I think he could honestly flirt with like eight touchdowns next year it's not unreasonable to think that yeah, it's like impossible to predict touchdown numbers. So yeah. if a couple of them go his way instead of, you know, someone else's way, Fitz could – I mean, as much as I love Christian Kirk, Fitz finishing as the number one fantasy wide receiver on that team, if I looked back, it, would, it wouldn't it would shock me whatsoever. Yeah, and I know it's a completely new system and everything, but we saw a couple of years ago with, like, John Brown and Larry Fitzgerald. Like, they both produced in Arizona. I know it's, like, completely different and everything, but we've seen this team produce more than one fantasy receiver, and even Michael Floyd in that same year. So – um, it's not out of the question that both guys could greatly outproduce their ADP. And Fitzgerald's the 45th wide receiver off the board. There's, like, literally no risk in taking him at that spot. Yeah, this is just another interesting offense. This might – the Cardinal situation might be the most <laughs> intriguing overall because it's not only like, oh, we want to see what happens with this new head coach. It's like they also fucking had the number one pick into Kyler Murray. So it's like this perfect storm of just craziness in Arizona. A lot of hype. Um Still a lot of missing pieces on the team overall from the depth chart perspective, but it'll uh, it'll be a lot of fun to watch. So I think that's the last bold prediction, right? Yeah, one last thing. When you when you brought up Kyler Murray, I just looked at like the bottom right of my computer and looked at the date, and I was so pissed that we don't have football for two more months. Yeah, <laughs> dude, it's literally two months and one day. It's September 5th is the Thursday night kickoff. So well, actually, by the time they're watching this, it'll be less than two months. So we're almost here. I feel like I've been doing almost this. there, boys. <laughs> We've been talking in this offseason for like two years already. It's fucking out of control. I'm so ready for this. It's going to be ridiculous. So, I'm so ready. I cannot wait. All right. That's, uh, that's going to be it for today's episode, guys. All we ask is that you hit that thumbs up button if you enjoyed. Subscribe to the channel if you are new. Go follow both of us on Twitter. Our name should be down there beneath us. Go cop the draft guide. I promise it will be the thing that you least regret this summer. It'll help you for every league that you're in. Cop once, use as many times as you want. That is it. We will see y'all on next Tuesday's episode. 